question. Who was the first actor to appear as James Bond in the movies? If you said Sean Connery, you're wrong. This is the first image movie audiences saw of James Bond. And the man playing 007? Bob Simmons. Before Bob introduced his own style, most of the stunt performers were really advanced extras. Bob Simmons was an ex-serviceman. He was in the army, in the uh, physical training corps, um, just towards the end of the war. Bob was a great friend of Terence Young's, who was the original director of the Bond films. He was part of the creation of James Bond, if you like. He came into it because he, he looked so much like Sean. Bob had done really wonderful work in the early James Bond movies. Bob Simmons is remembered as one of the most innovative stunt arrangers in the film industry. His staged fights are noted for their creative use of props, and he invented the two-man switch, where the stuntman disappears for a moment and the actor replaces him. He had one famous pet maneuver. I think it was called a Japanese somersault. He always managed to introduce that somewhere along the line. Bob did give it a lot of glamour. Very, very good uh, stunt director and fighter ranger. Well, he was an extrovert. He was... Uh... He enjoyed life. He managed to inject a great deal of enthusiasm into everybody who worked with him. He liked a good drink up and sing song. He was good to have around, not only because he was somehow, but because he also brought good food. Bob was so enthusiastic himself that he passed on to everybody who worked for him. He said, uh, I don't want to be a millionaire, I just want to live like one. In fact, I think he lived like a multi-millionaire. I never forget those words because he did. He lived like one until the end. He did live life to the fullest. He, you know, be the best champagne flown in from anywhere around the world, and uh, he had a hell of a life. Whatever money he earned, he spent it as quickly as he could. Bob was always one film behind, paying off the last film's extravagances. And he, well, he was Bond, really, I think. He was one of the, the greatest stuntmen we've had in England. For the second Bond film, From Russia With Love, Peter Perkins steps into the stunt arranger's spot. He only took over when Bob was away. He basically handed that one over to Peter Perkins because he was on another film. Very good. Mm. The stunt doubles were excellent in England. We had some excellent people, I must say, working with us. They really were very good. Simmons returns for Goldfinger, a film loaded with eye-popping stunts. The pre credit sequence alone features two different stunt performers doubling Sean Connery. The bit where he comes up with a duck was Georgie Leach. And then the very next shot where he jumps down from the wall and kicks the guy in the face is myself doubling Sean. Simmons also chooses Alf Joint to play a small role in the film. He said, right, well, you're doing the fight. And uh, I said, oh, what fight? There was a very hard balsa wood chair that, uh, and he had a very, very thin shirt on. And I had to keep whacking him with this. So it went on about five or six takes. And I thought, well, any minute now, I'm going to get this chair out of my ear off because he's not going to take too much of this. But. Uh, he stood it very well. But the hardest part was we did a number where I had to throw a punch and Sean ducks his head and I go flying over the top. And I did it about eight times. And uh, by the end of it, I was, I'd had enough. I thought, well, that's it, fellas. Can I just sort of sit this one out for a bit? My involvement was crashing the Aston Martin, doubling for Sean Connery. Leach performs the stunt twice. On this first attempt, he drives through the fake wall, almost crashing the car for real. The second take is perfect and appears in the film. Leach also plays a part in Q's lab. It was the first time I'd ever experienced anything like this. It shocked me a little bit with the explosions across my chest. The climatic raid on Fort Knox calls for airborne skills. Bob Simmons did a very good fall where he falls right into the lens. Now, <laughs> Joint did another fall from there, and I did another one from uh, a lower balcony. Thunderball begins with a showcase fight, with Bob Simmons himself playing Colonel Jacques Boutois and arranging a fight in which every bit of furniture and pottery is destroyed. And 20-year-old Bill Souter portrays 007 for Bond's escape from Chateau Danet. Salzman and Broccoli decided, boy, that's what James Bond needs is a jetpack. And the, uh, the movie Thunderball was really the first big movie it ever appeared in. Thunderball also requires a truly cutting-edge stunt. I came to the studio, walked on the stage, and saw six sheets of glass standing 
near the, the set I was working on. And I said, what are they for? He said, well, we're going to do six takes at least, you know, Bill, get it right. Oh, I said, no, 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 Bob, you're getting one. On landing on the windowsill, I felt this pain in, 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 in the left eye. And I thought, I've, I've done some damage somewhere. Luckily, a surgeon was standing by in hospital. When I came back, the chauffeur took me in the bar, and Sean was sitting with a double randy. He was very considerate, very caring. He cared about about the stuntman. Other stuntmen share Sawyer's admiration for Connery. The ideal thing with him was that he looked manly and he could throw a punch. He looked as if he were going to knock you right through the wall. One time he picked up a chair to throw at me to knock me down the gangway and it was a real genuine iron chair. <laughs> he had to pick up that in the right and throw it in the right direction so that I didn't get hit by the, an edge or a corner. So he had to be skilled and keep his calm in those situations. The first major picture I worked on was You Only Live Twice in 1966. I was doing explosions and sliding down ropes and trampoline explosions, all that sort of thing. I still admire, when I see that film, I admire the work that Bob Simmons did on that, rehearsing it all and getting it going. Leach himself becomes the stunt coordinator for the next Bond adventure. George Leach is a very quiet person, very opposite to Bob. I've worked with George many times over the years, uh, excellent uh, stunt performer and coordinator. He's now my father-in-law, funnily enough, and he coordinated on the Magic Secret Service. I've worked on a dozen um, Bond pictures altogether. He was a very good amateur welterweight boxer. A tremendous gymnast. A great vision um, uh, in terms of what he's asking the guys to do and I always enjoyed working with him. We got a full-size trampoline at home and he come over to see his grandchildren. He gets on the trampoline and somersaults and things and he's well into his 70s now. Vic Armstrong doubles the new 007 George Lazenby. And it was like four months work doubling Lazenby and uh, you know a good a kudos for me as a, a up-and-coming stuntman. Champion Olympic athlete Willie Bogner provides the skiing action. Bogner invents his own camera system. The trick was not to use any rigs because rigs make it less uh, variable. You know, with holding it in your hands, you can pan, you can even shoot backwards. Uh, you can shoot through your legs, you can ski backwards and, and, and really pinpoint the camera. He used to go backwards down his bob run. God knows how he did it, skiing backwards down the bob run. Speed is always visible with things flying by. So if you shoot a sequence in the trees, for instance, it, it looks much better. Or in a bob run, you know, where you have the walls really close and, and you, you can actually feel the speed. He would just go down there and slide backwards and have complete control of the camera. But he was a, he was a miracle man. When Connery returns for Diamonds Are Forever, Bob Simmons also returns, coordinating the stunt work filmed at Pinewood. Basically, there's nothing more boring than a couple of blokes swinging at each other. And I began to think about having a fight in this elevator. I hadn't worked with Bob before, in fact, and it got on very well. But really, Sean and me, we both worked the fight out ourselves. I remember Sean saying, look, what are they going to do next? Have a fight in a telephone box? Most stuntmen have a healthy respect for Sean. And this is what makes Sean a wonderful Bond. When he hits, he means it. He goes in there and... I'm gonna hit I remember, you. <laughs> I remember it well. <laughs> George Leach doubles Putter Smith for the blazing finale with fire effects courtesy of special effects man John Steers. He used all the appropriate chemicals and fire prevention gear and I went up into a great sheet of flame and staggered about and jumped over the side of the ship and I was okay. Thank you, John Steers. What the... The next film, Live and Let Die, finds a new bond up to old tricks. It's a tremendous job organizing uh, and shooting stunt sequences, especially when the, you know, all stunt sequences are dangerous. Harry and Cubby got hold of a young man from the southern states of America called Jerry Como. His function on the film is stunt driver, stunt coordinator, and also uh, my teacher. They came up uh, with some very creative ideas, I might say, about a boat chase sequence. And of course, let's say artistic people have quite uh, a large or wide span of imagination 
in what they would like to achieve, and it was my responsibility to curb that somewhat to determine what we could physically do with the equipment that was made available to us. Jerry Chipwood did all the car stunt. and the plane stump where the wings come off the plane. They were a very, very good team. Another team working on the film is the Hollywood Black Stuntmen's Association. I'm Eddie Smith, the uh, business manager for the Black Stuntmen's Association. We couldn't get into the White Stuntmen's Association and uh, we had to organize ourselves. When the unit returns to Pinewood, Vic Armstrong becomes James Bond, doubling Roger Moore in the climactic fight. That again was, was pretty interesting, working with Bob Simmons, who coordinated it all. Moore's next Bond film tests his acting chops. The martial arts scenes require special instruction for the actors. I was trained every day, at least hour, if not two hours, for towards the, you know, the fight. So I kind of remember that wardrobe lady designer saying that they had to alter all the you know, wardrobes because I keep losing the weight. One of the girls is a daughter of the head of the Secret Service. Quite uh, ordinary girls, except that they were really skilled in the martial arts. The film also features another amazing car stunt, courtesy of Jay Milligan's driving team, with Lauren Willard at the wheel. You're not thinking that. I sure am, boy. There's seven or eight mathematical functions of, of geometry and physics that affect the roll velocity and the landing and the takeoff of the car. The computer was able to program all of that to what we thought was a successful stunt. You look back at it and you say, I achieved world fame by working with Bond. Another mind-boggling stunt opens The Spy Who Loved Me. When people find out that I've done a lot of the aerial stunts, especially the skydiving stunts and the bonds, one of their first questions they ask me is, did you do the ski jump off the mountain? <laughs> and I would love to say yes, but uh, I can't take credit. Rick Sylvester did a tremendous job doing that. It's a very memorable jump. At that time, that was the most incredible thing anybody had ever seen. That was a phenomenal stunt. That stunt is uh, sort of a signature stunt for all the Bond films, and it's uh, a tremendous effort. One very generous reviewer called it the greatest stunt in the history of movies. I'd agree with him, but I'd, I'd give the credit to nature because the, the setting is what made it for me. Most of the skiing leading up to the jump was filmed six months later in Switzerland on a glacier by Willy Bogner. You have to know what you're doing. You're on dangerous terrain. There's crevasses, there's uh, weather problems, but every, no, no accidents, nothing, so it, it worked out fine. The Spy Who Loved Me allows Martin Grace to become James Bond. My main piece in that was riding the ball at the top while all the action was going on down below. The thing with Roger is he did a lot of stuff himself. We had to be careful that he didn't do too much. Otherwise, we'd all be out of a job if he had an injury. I don't recall any actor in my career who could throw a punch as good as Roger. He threw a great punch and he could do a, a rough and tumble with anybody. When asked if he did his own stunts, he would always say yes, and I do all my own lying. Moonraker again begins with a stunning aerial stunt. I was a world champion, the captain of the US team as a world champion. I was a um, world champion a couple of times, national champion a couple of times. And my partner was a free fall photographer, and the first feature we did was Moonraker. His partner's girlfriend was the secretary for the United States Parachute Association, and the phone call came looking for a free fall cinematographer and a couple guys that were really good skydivers. And the secretary said, well, the president that you want to talk to is out, but uh, I know the best who to tell you right now. We were jumping hidden parachutes, which we'd had to develop because no one had ever really done that much before. It's psychologically uh, tough because it feels like you don't have a parachute on, but in fact, we really do have one. So this is a, a fun part of doing the aerial stunts. People remember that today, and that was 1978. If you mention Moonraker, if they know the movie or they're Bond fans, they'll know that sequence. Another memorable sequence is done on location with Martin Grace as Jaws, and Dickie Graydon as Bond. Uh, Richard Graydon is one of our stalwarts of the uh, British uh, stunt fraternity. There was no one to touch him for hanging on things. When closer shots are done at Pinewood, Paul Weston doubles Richard Keel. They brought the two cars back to Pinewood Studios, put them 25 feet up in the air, uh, 16 feet apart. The character's supposed to jump from one cable car to the other. What I did was put a mini trampoline on the top of my cable car 
uh, and I stood on top of the cables, balanced on the top there, jumped, I had to jump from the cable down onto the mini trampoline and 16 feet across the gap into onto the other uh, cable car. So I jumped down, hit the mini trampoline, bounced across and just got onto the other side. But I stubbed my toe, I can't tell you. You're traveling so fast uh, from that distance. For your eyes only has aerial stunts with Martin Grace doubling Roger Moore. That was one of the highlights because it was incredible excitement. Hold tight. And below the waves action. So I actually was the subject being uh, pulled off with Dorothy Ford, um, who was a lady down stunt double. And we were actually pulled off the back. That was a little bit of an impact. There was a fight in a monastery and a pike was supposedly thrown at the character of Bond being played by Martin Grace and it actually caught part of his hand and Roger who was standing off camera said there for the God of Grace go I. Willie Bogner returns for more ski action creating scenes with vehicle stunts coordinator Remy Julien. We had to construct a winch in the back of the bob that would pull me up to the bob uh, all the while we, we were racing down this course. And now that was, was a little touchy because when the bob goes around turns, the distance changes. That means when you go into the turn, the wire you hooked on gets looser. But when it gets out of the, you get a real, uh, a real jolt. And they are just about, uh, you know, like a few feet behind you with their spikes. Remy Julien is made up to impersonate Bond for the chase through the olive grove. And Rick Sylvester gets a chance to become James Bond once again. I climbed about 15 years, but I'd never had a, a fall over a, something like 25 feet, a, a record of conservatism which I was, was proud of because I was a big chicken. I'm not with these macho stuntman types, really. I never really think of myself as a stuntman. I had a, a very short, dramatic career, two stunts that were both arguably somewhat famous. Octopussy as the 007 stuntman training. I think on Octopussy was probably the most dangerous thing I've ever done, which was uh, running along the top of the train. At one point, there was a, a pipe which was about four feet above the train. I'd lay down underneath it and get up and carry on running. And I said to the, the guys, um, if they see that on the, 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 the rushes, they're going to say, could I jump over it? Sure enough. Next day, I get a phone call. Is it possible to jump over the pipe? And you can see the pipe going underneath me. And I hit and bounced, but I was lucky enough, I just held on. But that was a, a, a tricky number to do. Weston also performs another train stunt. I thought, this is a great idea, low angle camera with, uh, I'd slip and uh, my toes would hit the, the, the sleepers. I can't tell you the pain. All I had was a pair of ordinary shoes on. And to hit the sleepers with these these, my toes was very painful, but I'd set the shot up. I had to go through with it. Dickie Graydon also doubles Roger Moore. I was with another stuntman up there called Wayne Michaels, and we both had to jump together. And as he went first, I had to wait for him until he jumped. If he hadn't gone at the right second, then the train would have passed the point at which I could leave off onto the bed. And he was very good. He timed it perfectly. Stunt coordinator Martin Grace also doubles Bond in the sequence and nearly ends his career. Unfortunately, on that sequence, Martin Grace, who was doubling Roger Moore, was hanging outside the carriage as the train went along the rail. And there was one section of the railway that hadn't been cleared or passed as safe when Martin was hanging out. The train went a little farther than the, it was supposed to. Had I been able to look forward, I would have seen whatever the obstacle was and, pu and pull in, you know, or miss it. He hit an actual concrete post as the train was, he was hanging on the side of the train, and he hit the post and he was quite badly injured. I was still hanging there after the train had stopped, although my pelvis was broken, but um, I was lucky on that occasion. Martin survived it, but he spent six months in hospital, going through a lot of therapy to get him, and was back again working on the next one. I was doubling for Roger and I was swinging from the balloon uh, basket that uh, Q was in. I had to get it dead right to smash 
my body through the portal wood. Somebody said, um, oh, we've made those shutters a bit strong, stronger for you, Paul. He said, oh, I bet you I bet you have your rotters, you know. And we, and, but we hadn't done a thing to them, actually. They'd all been chopped and cut and ready to go through. We hadn't done a thing, um, but we were joking with them about it. They were all shuttered. So what they were going to do is put balsa wood across and use balsa wood as a shutter. He came swinging in on the rope, came in and... <laughs> smashed it. it didn't move at all and he's even to this day he thinks we did something to it, but we didn't <laughs> in the climax jake lombard plays bond for a second time in octopussy i got to lay up on top of this airplane and do big old rolls with the, you know on the outside they dive the thing at 160 knots pull it up just incredible <laughs> A View to a Kill takes James Bond to Paris's most famous landmark. At one point she turns around and she casts a line with a fishing rod and she hooks it around Bond's legs and lifts him over the side, which I was involved with that part. Then she sort of gets away up to the top and jumps off the top of the Eiffel Tower, which was done by B.J. Worth. Cubby asked me to fall for three seconds before I opened my parachute, so that was rather difficult because a parachute takes about 250 feet to open and by falling for three seconds I was down about 250 feet which didn't give me a whole big margin of error. When they said action I yelled this one's for you Cubby and ran off the tower and uh, it worked. Then we had the car chase with Remy Julian's uh, team. There's always a team of assistants who will stop traffic which is the most vulnerable situation really is traffic and people wandering in who don't belong in the movie and providing you can control that the rest is very controllable and then I take over and uh, do the jump from the bridge onto the boat. Well, actually, beside the boat, the idea was to um, jump beside it. So filming it, you just saw the drop just to the roof, and then the cutaway and go inside in the studio, and we have a stunt person come through onto the wedding cake. In San Francisco, Grace choreographs a punch-up on top of the Golden Gate Bridge. Often people are arrested for trying to climb on the <laughs> Golden Gate Bridge. I had the luxury of being allowed to go up there and, and, and struggle with the other double, you know. They told us that we couldn't throw any punches, so if you look at it, we were struggling more, you know. I might have raised my fist once or twice, but, but that, that was one of the stipulations, was that we weren't supposed to actually fight seriously. Who'd want to? Also returning for more ski action is Willy Bogner. Having a big crew, like 120 people, working around crevasses and still avoiding accidents, I think that's also a challenge by itself. Paul Weston coordinates the amazing stunt work of The Living Daylights. When you're asked to do a film like The Bond, you are taking over from people like Bob Simmons, who was the master of the Bonds, who created the early action and some great fights, and it's a, a great responsibility. Timothy was very good. He used to say that he did the action, and uh, Paul and the stunt guys do the stunts. I was very new to the business at that stage, so to get a break doubling for James Bond was a very high point of my career. I actually started off at law school. The film's climax once again calls upon the talents of B.J. Worth and Jake Lombard. This time, Worth gets to be James Bond. It had the uh, heart populating a little bit for a while. We built a ripcord system in the net, and you had to hang on, get your feet and hands on both sides of it, and then we built it so the guy in the plane could pull the ripcord, and then you just sort of let go and open the net up. There was no computerization about that. They, they were up there doing it. So here you are, all these bags are hitting you like at 120 miles an hour, and you have to still hang on. We're both on there, and we're just slamming into each other and crashing around, flopping up close to the tail and back down. Probably one of the, the best things that have been done on the bonds for, for physical danger. BJ had to let go, he let go a few times by accident or to save himself because it was getting too weird. Fortunately, I had the hidden parachute, and that's why we had it. Any time that you cover up the parachute equipment, obviously the first problem is the parachute is on the inside of the wardrobe. It was the first time we've ever had to use one of the hidden parachutes for a safety mechanism. The wardrobe has to be fitted to the parachute equipment so that you can expose the parachute when you need to expose it and have it operate properly. One thing BJ and I often comment to each other is, boy, look at the rides we've gotten from James Bond movies, you know. License to Kill once again calls on the skills of Worth and Lombard and the driving expertise of Remy Julien. Simon Crane again doubles Timothy Dalton. You've always got to be pushing things to the limit, but with safety. I've never injured myself on a Bond film. 
GoldenEye opens with another high-flying 007 stunt performed by Wayne Michaels. He did that bungee leap, which I thought was very excellent. It demanded great body control, and it was flawless. The pre-credits end with a stunt that combines the talents of Jacques Zoumalnoui on the motorcycle and B.J. Worth doing a truly high dive. The uh, plane had more mass than I did, so it would fall faster than I could. I would step out of the airplane, and it would turn over, nose down, and I would get in a very fast fall, head down dive, and all the kerosene in the airplane's in my face for like 30 seconds. It was very hard to go toward it. One time I, the, I got very near the tail and actually slapped the tail, let the pilot know that I was there just for fun. Simon Crane becomes stunt coordinator for GoldenEye. And you really have to rehearse where everyone's gonna be. You've got to know from special effects where they expect the heat to be. Often the stuntmen will be wearing fire suits or fire gel as protection. And so special effects wouldn't cue the explosion to go off unless they saw that the stuntmen were all at their given marks where they were told that it was safe. And longtime 007 veteran Vic Armstrong directs the second unit action for Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough. My wife's a stunt woman. She did Michelle Yeoh on the motorbike. No Bond film is complete without an aerial stunt. In Tomorrow Never Dies, we did what's known as a halo jump, high altitude, low opening. I had a plan that we could use a telephoto lens from a helicopter. And what we ended up doing is I stepped out of the helicopter maybe 2,000 feet. I actually opened 1,000 feet above the water, and it made it look like I was maybe less than 100 feet above the water. When you think how many jumps he's done and uh, what he's achieved on the films, it really is amazing. Over nearly four decades of James Bond adventures, what all the stuntmen have achieved has been amazing. From Dr. No to The World Is Not Enough, one thing remains constant. No one man can perform the feats of 007. We all looked after Bond and tried to make him as best as we possibly could. The one thing that keeps going on is 007. He seems to be quite indestructible. I went with that character and I wanted to be Bond. For those few seconds, I was James Bond.